Hey interwebs and welcome to WatchGuard Security Week in Review, a video podcast dedicated to quickly summarizing the biggest information and network security stories each week and to sharing practical security tips along the way. I'm your host and all-around security geek, Corey Nockreiner, and this is the episode for the week starting October 12th, 2015. Let's jump right in with this week's daily stories. Today's story is a zero-day root vulnerability affecting Netgear routers. On a blog post, a security researcher disclosed details for two different vulnerabilities affecting a number of different Netgear broadband routers and wireless access points. He actually shares a whole lot of technical detail showing how he actually reversed the firmware on these routers to find the vulnerabilities. But at a very high level, the first vulnerability is an authentication bypass vulnerability. Basically, if an attacker can visit a specially crafted URL, he can actually skip the authentication and gain full root access to your router. The second vulnerability is something called a command injection vulnerability. And with this, the attacker can actually inject commands on your router to get it to do whatever he wants. Now, there's good news and bad news here. Uh, The bad news is, unfortunately, Netgear has not fixed this yet. They're aware of the flaws, but they haven't released a patched firmware yet. Now, the good news is an attacker can only exploit this flaw if he has access to the web-based administration page. And by default, Netgear routers do not allow what's called wide area network administration or remote administration. So an attacker can only leverage this if you've turned that on or if the attacker has access to your internal network, maybe via your Wi-Fi. So what's the takeaway here? First of all, as soon as Netgear releases the fixed firmware, you should install it. Second of all, make sure to disable remote administration of these Netgear devices. And finally, make sure to secure your wireless access point using WPA2 and a strong password so attackers can actually gain access to your internal network. Today's story is Microsoft Patch Day, woohoo! <laughs> Actually, I doubt anyone gets that excited about Microsoft Patch Day. It happens every single month and we have to go out and update a whole bunch of servers. However, you probably should get excited about Patch Day because it's one of the most important ways to secure your network. Around 90% of the, the attacks on the internet actually leverage vulnerabilities that have been fixed a long time ago. So if you do one thing to secure yourself, it should be to patch your software as often as possible. Anyway, it's the second Tuesday of the month, which of course means Microsoft Patch Day. And today, Microsoft released six security bulletins, three of which they rate critical. These bulletins fix a whole bunch of security flaws in their browsers, both Internet Explorer and the new Edge browser, in a number of Windows components like VBScript, and in their Office packages. Now, there's a ton of vulnerabilities they fix, but at a high level, uh, the biggest ones are probably the browser vulnerabilities. The Internet Explorer update fixes a lot of memory corruption flaws, and bad guys often use these in drive-by download attacks, where if they can just get you to come to a website with some malicious code, even a legitimate one which they might have booby-trapped, they can use these vulnerabilities to silently force code on your computer. In fact, some of the Windows vulnerabilities are similar to this. The VB scripting vulnerability, even though it's in a Windows component, is actually accessed through Internet Explorer as well. On top of that, there's some Office vulnerabilities, again, some memory corruption vulnerabilities having to do with parsing a Microsoft Office documents. Long story short, if your user downloads the wrong document, it could take advantage of one of these flaws to force malicious code on that user's computer. Really, at the end of the day, I highly recommend you install these Microsoft updates as quickly as possible. Uh, Definitely prioritize the critical ones. It's important you get to the Internet Explorer ones and the Office ones, since those affect a lot of your users, and a lot of the attacks out there will be targeting those users. As an aside, Adobe shares Microsoft Patch Day, and they released a security bulletin to fix 13 vulnerabilities in Flash. I won't go into all the details, but like the Internet Explorer flaws, these Flash flaws can allow malicious websites to do drive-by downloads on your computer. So be sure to get that Flash update as well. And don't forget the reader update if you didn't get that last week. Today's story is USB Killer 2.0, a device killing USB stick. 
This is actually an interesting story in that I'm not talking about USB malware or Trojans. Instead, this is a small USB device that can actually damage your computer or any other device that takes USB sticks. A Russian researcher posted about this on his blog where he detailed how he made a very small USB stick. It looks like any other USB storage device that can actually fry your laptop. Without going into all the hardware details, it seems that he just packed a whole bunch of capacitors in this USB stick. When you plug this device into your computer or any other USB plug, it uses the 5 volt uh, power to charge the capacitors and then dump 220 volts back into the signal wires of the USB device. And this can actually fry the motherboard of your computer. In fact, the researcher created this short video you're watching that demonstrates this particular attack. Now the good news is this probably won't damage your data or your hard drive. This will fry the motherboard and damage your computer, but you can probably recover your data. Now, I really don't suspect attackers will use this very often in the real world. Often, uh, an attacker wants to damage or hurt your data so that you can't recover it. Just damaging your computer while costly is a recoverable attack. That said, perhaps hacktivists might use this in the future to send some sort of message. Now, what are the practical tips here? Well, first of all, you really need to be careful with unsolicited USB devices. You already know that plugging in a USB device that you don't trust may actually introduce malware to your computer. There's lots of techniques bad guys can leverage to force uh, USB devices to automatically run malware on those devices. And with this attack, plugging a USB device into your computer may even be fatal to your laptop. So be very careful about when you plug devices into your laptop. Make sure that you trust where they come from. Anyways, this was an interesting hardware hack. I don't think attackers will leverage it in the real world, but it's yet another reason to remain suspicious of random uh, USB keys you might receive. Today's story is a new Adobe Flash Zero Day flaw. According to a blog post by Trend Micro, the threat actors that are responsible for the Pawn Storm campaign, which I've talked about in the past, have a new attack that's leveraging a new Flash Zero Day vulnerability. Just to refresh your memory, just at the beginning of this week, Adobe released a new flash update. But these actors are using a new exploit that hasn't even been fixed. So I just wanted to warn you about this new flash zero day. Now Trend Micro, who's our IPS partner, has already informed Adobe of this vulnerability. And according to an Adobe security advisory they just released, they plan on releasing yet another fix, a flash fix for this on October 19th. So the main takeaway here is to be sure to install that new flash update on October 19th when it comes out. Until that time, you might want to consider what whether or not you really need to use Flash in your business. Uh, as more and more of the web goes to HTML5, we have less reasons to actually use Flash. And over the past few years, there's been many, many Flash vulnerabilities. So if you don't have to use it on your computer, I would consider not installing it at all. Today's story is drone hacking. Since it's Friday, I figured I'd end with a light story that intersects with both information security and one of my personal hobbies, which is remote control multi-rotors, or what the rest of the world calls drones. I'm actually a drone hobbyist and I use them for a lot of aerial videography because you can get some pretty amazing shots. But this week a security researcher posted on the Shell Intel blog a way to actually hijack one of the communication protocols used by many popular drones. In the blog post he talks about the Mavlink protocol which is a, a open communication protocol many popular drones use to share telemetry data. For instance you might share GPS waypoints so the drone can automatically automatically navigate itself or you might throttle it up or down or things like that. In any case, these researchers found that this Mavlink protocol is pretty open. It uses a particular identifier to identify that the controller really should control that radio, but these researchers found that it was trivia for them to sniff that communication and find that particular identifier, and then they wrote a custom firmware and used a Raspberry Pi so that they could actually spoof that identifier. Long story short, with a little Raspberry Pi in a wireless device, these attackers were able to actually control the Mavlink communication to any drone out there. And in the video I've been playing in the background, you can see how these researchers could use that to either uh, force a drone to land or even crash, and they could also use it to make it so the drone couldn't arm itself. So you might create a device that would prevent drones from taking off in a certain area if they happen to use this Mavlink protocol like many of the popular drones do. In any case, I found this to be a very interesting story, especially with my 
interest in both information security and drones. And while you may not think that this has any sort of practical implications in network security or your everyday job, you need to realize that it's a perfect example of some of the issues with the Internet of Things. While drones are very specific technologies, they actually are just computers wirelessly communicating with network protocols. If it's a computer, it contains software, and if it communicates on a network, whether wired or wireless, it could have many of the same vulnerabilities that our normal traditional computer systems do. So as you adopt more and more uh, non-traditional computers into your business infrastructure, you definitely need to think about how to secure these Internet of Things. Anyways, I just thought it was a fun and interesting security-related story for Friday. That's all I have for you this week. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, if you want more security information, be sure to follow WatchGuard's blog at blog.watchguard.com or at watchguardsecuritycenter.com. Besides posting this video there, I post links to many other security stories as well as security articles as well. You can also follow us on Twitter. I'm at SecAdept, or you can follow WatchGuard at WatchGuardTech. Also, subscribe to the YouTube video if you want to receive uh, notifications of these videos as soon as I post them. In any case, as always, thank you for watching, and here at WatchGuard, we're rooting for you.